Dana Haney went to a conference in Philadelphia where Dr. Ihali Akala Hu Lin was leading that seminar on Ho Oponopono. That sounds like I just spoke in tongues, but I really didn't. His name really is Dr. Ihali Akala Hu Lin. And Ho Oponopono is a Polynesian word that Ho O means to cause. Pono Pono means perfection. So Ho Opono Pono means to cause perfection. It's a way to solve problems. It's a way to pray. She was pretty excited about this conference. She got there. She liked it. He was fascinated. He drew on the marker board. He dialogued with the people. He let them ask questions. She got to about the third day, which was on a Sunday, and she started feeling in that conference. She'd ask a lot of questions, participate. It wasn't a huge crowd. There was a lot of time for questions and answers. And she started feeling like this man doesn't respect me. I think he's being disrespectful to me. I think he's kind of arrogant. I think he's kind of haughty. I think he dismisses me. And she started feeling this rage toward him. And she thought, you know, I'm, I, I don't even know if I'm going to stay for the rest of this. I don't like him. I just don't think he's a nice person. She's having all these bad feelings. And she realized I better get out of here because I might burst into tears. It was getting so strong. So she went to the ladies room. Nobody else was in there. She went in stall. She locked the door. The smells of ammonia and Clorox and all that were permeating the freshly clean ladies room. And she sat down and she kept trying to do Ho'oponopono. She kept saying to God, to herself, to Dr. Lynn, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And she would pick a phrase and she'd just stay on it. She was getting desperate. It's like, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. She was talking to the rage inside of her. And as she kept thinking about how disrespectful and unkind and inconsiderate and embarrassing he had been to her, a peace came over her. She didn't understand it. When this peace came, inspiration, a message from God came to her that these are not unfamiliar feelings. You've been having these feelings in your life for a long, long time. These feelings are coming from your mother who was an attorney who could make anything, everything absolutely black and white. So matter, no matter what she did, she was always wrong. Her mother was always right. And she grew up with this mom with a very strong male side. And then her husband, as she described him, was a man with an iron will, which was very good in business because he was tenacious. He wouldn't give up. He'd always get the job done. He was very successful. But he'd come home and he'd bring that iron will with him. And sometimes he wasn't easy to get along with. And she just realizes, oh, my goodness, these bad feelings have been in me just about all of my life. And she went back to the conference. This time, she just felt good about Dr. Lynn. And it seemed like he was so kind and so loving and so gentle with her and everybody else. When the conference ended, this session ended, she went up and said, could I talk to you just for a moment? She said, I just had the most incredible experience. He said, yeah, I'd love to hear about it. He was friendly. He was interested. He said, tell me about it. As soon as she told him this, he said, this is all about male dominance. It's been going on for thousands of years. Your mother had a strong male side. She was an attorney. She was articulate. She knew how to win arguments. She lived in a man's world back in those days. And and then your husband is very strong and dominant. And you cleaned yourself of the emotional tension that went with that by doing Ho'oponopono in the bathroom. As soon as you cleared yourself, it made way for inspiration from God. And he said, these are not new feelings. It's not just about him. You've been living with these and various people will stir them up within you. Well, she's thinking, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. She stayed for the conference. They got to the last day. And one of the things he did, he gave them a lot of exercises and things to do. And as she said, most of these things seemed silly, didn't make any logical, rational sense. She had gone for the information and they're doing silly little exercises. 
and they came to one of these silly little exercises. He said, each of you has a piece of typing paper in front of you. I'd like for ta- you to take the pen that came with the piece of paper that's in front of you and write three words on this piece of paper, one at the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom. Now think, what are three problems in your life? The top of the page, she wrote computer. The middle of the page, husband. The bottom of the page, son. He said, now, everybody got your three words written? He said, I want to pick up your pen, and I want you to say, do drop. And she thought, I'll play along. She said, do drop. He said, I want you to take your pen, now that you've said do drop, and tap on each one of those words. So computer, tap, husband, tap, son, tap. And that was the end of that. And she thought that was just the biggest waste of time. She had no idea. She finished up the seminar. She went home. She went home to find her husband and her son eagerly awaiting for her. They were so excited. Now, before she left, they'd been having all kinds of trouble with the computer. And they had computer technicians in the house every week for the last several weeks. And when the computers went down, it caused turmoil in the family. She gets home. They're both excited. Said, guess what we got? She said, a puppy. No. A kitten. No. What'd you get? Guess again. A computer. Yes. Now, just before she left, they decided they were going to wait six months for the new really high-powered computer that was 64-bit to come out. That was a long, long time ago. And so she thought they wouldn't get new computers for at least another six months. They had bought a computer. They were so excited. They said, guess what kind we got? Now, her husband with the iron wheel has told the family from the beginning, before the son was born, we will have nothing but PCs in this household. None of that Apple stuff. We're staying with PCs. And she kind of liked Apple. She thought, I like the way it looks. I think it looks nicer. I understand it's easier. It didn't get viruses. I kind of like it. He said, no way. So she let that go a long time ago. They said, guess what kind we got? She says, okay. She knows this. Dell. No. Compact. No. Toshiba. No. Sony. No. Hewlett Packard. No. She ran out of words and said, come on, guess again. She said, I've listed every kind of computer we could possibly get. They said, come on, guess again. She couldn't come up with anything. And they both looked at each other and looked at her and yelled, Apple, we got an Apple computer. That shocked her. She said it would have been easier for her to understand that China set Tibet free. I mean, it was like just rocked her. Not the impossible had happened. And she was amazed. She continued to do Ho'oponopono for the next couple of weeks. Her son had a lingering illness that had been with him for years. In the next two weeks, it went away and it never came back. Her husband was never open to talking about husband-wife relations, feelings, and things like that. He started being open and wanted to know how she felt about things. Wanted to talk about feelings, even shared some of his own. And about two weeks after she got by, back, he walked by one day, looked inside and said, hey, if you ever want one of these little Apple computers, we will get it for you. You can have your very own. Just blew her away. And then it came back to her. Do drop, tap, tap, tap. When she worked on herself, God helped her. When she changed what was inside of her, her world began to change. So where we are today, two weeks ago, we did an overview on Ho'oponopono. It's Polynesian. It's exceedingly biblical. We're mandated in scripture to do all four of these statements. First is I love you. Second is I'm sorry. Third is about forgiveness. And sometimes it may be I forgive you. Please forgive me. It can go either way, however you're led in the moment. And the fourth thing is thank you. 
Those things are all over scripture. So even though this is coming out of a Polynesian culture, a lot happens. So what we're looking at today is the second phrase, I'm sorry. A lot can happen when you say, I'm sorry. A lot can happen when you take responsibility for your whole world, everybody and everything in it, and you say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I've caused you pain, if I've hurt you in any way, or if any of my ancestors, going back to the beginning of mankind, did anything to your ancestors that have made life hard or difficult or uncomfortable for you. I take full responsibility. Please forgive me. Thank you. So we're looking at what happens when people stand in the gap and say, I'm sorry. All throughout scripture, God has been looking for people who will stand in the gap, who will stand between God, who's sending his love to people. And these people that don't know him, haven't had his love, are often misbehaving to bridge that gap and bring them together. In Ezekiel chapter 22, I think the iPad on site has fallen over and he's gone offline. Let's just hold on a moment and see if he happens to get it back on. I am so sorry. On Zoom, my earpiece and my microphone fell out of my ear. When I picked it up, I touched it in the wrong place, and that took me off of Zoom. So I'm back, and by God's grace, it won't fall out again. I'm probably just shaking my head way too much today. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. And God is speaking to Ezekiel. He said, and I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. God calls all of us to stand in the gap. Ho'oponopono is one of the most effective, efficient, easiest ways I've ever found to do this. And when we stand in the gap, we're going to see the, faith, the, the fathers of our faith standing in the gap. So let's go back to Genesis. We find Abraham, an absolutely phenomenal man of God, somebody who believes God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And in Genesis chapter 18, God has told him, and this is one of the things that's happened. When you get to know God, when you get closer to God, he's, he'll share secrets with you. He will tell you what's coming. He will help you prepare. He will help you get ready for it. And he tells, he tells, he tells Abraham, hey, I'm going to take out Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let's go back a little bit. Abraham had a nephew, Lot. And Lot was just a pain. He was selfish. He was egotistical. He was self-centered. And both of them had done very well. Lot did well because Abraham taught him how to do well, got him started. And Lot has huge herds. Abraham has huge herds. Back in those days, there was a shortage of food and water. They didn't have fences. They didn't have brands. They didn't have trackers on their cattle. And they had to keep their herds separated. That meant only one herd could be at the watering hole at one time. They had to leave before they could bring in the others. And Abraham and Lot's people were starting to quarrel and fight because Abraham understood the ways of God. He knew God doesn't want anything but peace. I have to take responsibility. I have to fix this. No matter what, God's priority is peace. So he went to Lot and he said, hey, listen, we can't have our people fighting, going to war with each other. We have to have peace. So I tell you what, Lot, if you go this way, I will go that way. If you go that way, I will go this way. I'm going to give you the choice. And Lot stood on top of the mountain where he was talking with Abraham and looked and he saw the desert. He saw the green pastures, the rivers, the streams, the lakes that were spring fed. He said, I think I'm going over here. Abraham, trusting God, said, well, 
I will go to the desert. God, you have to provide for me. God did. Lot chose the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's about to be taken out. Well, Abraham is willing to stand in the gap. God tells him, get your family out of Sodom. I'm, I'm about to destroy it. And he haggles with God. He said, God, are you really going to take out the whole city? Wouldn't you spare the city? What if I can find 50 righteous people? He cared about people. He's one of those people, anything in his world, he would take responsibility. Now, there's a principle here. When you take responsibility, God gives you more authority. He took responsibility for the city. He pleaded with God. If there are 50 righteous people, will you spare it? God said, yes. Now he starts to haggle. Well, if I, if I can only find 45, would you spare the city? God said, yeah, for you, I'll do that. What if there are only 40? Would you spare the city for 40? Yeah, 40. 30? Yes. 20? For you, Abraham, I will. God, what if I can only find 10 righteous people? He said, if you can, I will spare the city. He's trying. He's really trying. He couldn't find 10 righteous people. So Abraham got Lot out of the city. The fire from heaven rained down, totally destroyed those cities and everybody in them except for Lot's family. His wife disobeyed, turned to look back, turned into a pillar of salt, and that was that. Then we find Moses. Moses was always trying to stand in the gap between God and the people. There were times, multiple times, God just wanted to wipe them all out. Moses would stand in, in the middle. And in Exodus chapter 33, this is what he said. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have sat, said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Rest is one of the ways of God. Rest is culturally not very popular these days. But rest is important. You find rest in the garden in the beginning. God created rest. You'll find it all throughout the scriptures until we get to Revelation. Last week, we looked at Isaiah 30, 15. This is God's way. Now, I want you to understand here, this wise man is saying, God, I want to know your ways. You remember in Psalm 103, it said, and Israel, the nation, the people of Israel, saw the deeds, the works, the actions of God. Moses understood his ways. That separated the leaders from the followers. When you learn the ways of God, and you'll see Moses was learning when he learned the ways of God, then he would have God's favor. Well, why do you want God's favor? It's pretty impressive. Things that will happen. Galatians 1.10 says, the Apostle Paul is speaking, he said, am I still seeking the approval of people or of God? If I'm still seeking the approval of man, I cannot be a bondservant of Christ. So if you seek the approval of people, you will miss being a bondservant of Christ. And believe me, he treats his servants exceedingly well. There are 401ks, there are perks, there are vacations, there's time off with pay. There's incredible benefits if you're a bond servant of Christ. And then we see in Romans 14, 17, and 18, more the ways of God. Verse 17 is about the kingdom of God. It is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy are some of the ways of God. Next verse, anyone who seeks to serve God in this manner is pleasing to God 
and has the approval of man. If you seek the approval of man, if you go after that, you're going to miss God. If you go after God's kingdom, he will give you the approval of man. So Moses is already about the ways of God. He wants to understand. He wants to know God. And this is what happens. The church is full of people who know a lot about God. I was in my mid-40s. I knew a lot about God. I'd been to two Baptist seminaries and was on my way to a Catholic seminary. I was getting a full spectrum of the Judeo-Christian uh, perspective. Knew a lot about God. Didn't know God. I know a lot about Barack Obama, about Donald Trump, about Joe Biden, and the many Joe Biden doubles out there. I mean, I just, I know about them. I've never met one of them. I don't know them. They don't know me. Moses knew God. He wanted to learn his ways. Isaiah 30, 15 says, in repentance, does that sound like ho-o-pono-pono? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. In repentance and rest is your salvation. Salvation from what? Well, certainly from hell, but hell in the hereafter and hell now. In quietness and trust is your strength. I'm getting certified for Ho'oponopono right now just because God told me to. It's real easy. I had to watch eight videos and I have to take the test and I get three tries to pass it. And obviously it's open book online. I think I'll make it through it. I'm not sure. It could surprise me, but it's an easy certification. But I've just enjoyed watching these videos with Dr. Lynn. He died about a year ago. Man knows scripture. He teaches a lot. And I look at what happened yesterday. I was in the car going from one medical appointment to the next to the next and had time to listen to stuff. I was listening to a lady who had been at the Hawaiian Institute for the Criminally Insane that he cleared using Ho'oponopono. There were about 30 patients in solitary confinement, could not leave their cell unless they had steel shackles on their wrist and their ankles and a chain connecting those, or they were in a straitjacket. They were all heavily medicated. All of them except two got well and were released and went on to lead normal lives. I listened to an interview with a lady who was there while Dr. Lynn was there. She was hilarious. Said, we always wondered when he was going to lose his job because he didn't do anything he was supposed to do. He'd show up for his 20 hours a week that he had contracted with them to do because they were required by law to have a clinical psychologist on call and on site. That's how he got the job. He said, I'll take the job. I'll satisfy those requirements, but you got to let me do what I want to do. And they said, we just got to have somebody sign here. He's in. So he was usually late to work every day, and he was friendly. Nobody else there was friendly. They hated each other. They hated the prisoners. They hated themselves. They were just not happy campers. But he was always out in the hall visiting with the staff, getting to know them, friendly. He talked to the prisoners in the hall as they go by with their straight jackets and their shackles on, even though they were heavily medicated. He was friendly with them. He never had a client meeting with one of them. He never ran any psychological test. He never filled out the reports that he was supposed to turn in weekly. He just kind of sat around and was friendly with everybody and practiced Ho'oponopono. Back to Isaiah 30, 15. These are the ways of God. Don't miss it. He made a living doing Ho'oponopono. He didn't talk to other people that much. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And she noticed how people changed. After she'd been there about two years after he came, there was one criminal, a serial killer and rapist. And anytime she was in the hall with him or walk by his cell, every hair on her body would stand up. She could feel the evil. 
And way she, one day she turned around, he's coming down the hall. He was escorted by one of the staff members, no shackles, no straight jacket, off his medications. They made eye contact and they nearly touched shoulders when he passed by. The hair didn't stand up on her anymore. As she looked in his eyes, she felt peace and calm. This is what Dr. Lynn did from the quietness, from the trust. And folks, this is hard. It's hard to trust Ho'oponopono. It's easier to trust scripture. That's why I'm breaking it down into scripture. I love you. That's mandatory in scripture. I'm sorry. Talks about forgiveness. Please forgive me. I forgive you. That's again about this. So we see these things happening. Abraham and Moses stood in the gap. Then Jesus stood in the gap. And then Stephen, as they were about to stone him to death, now he just had this incredible open vision of heaven. He told them about it. It freaked them out. That's when they took him out to stone him. And they're stoning. And the last thing he said is, Father, forgive them. Sounds like Ho'oponopono to me. So we look at this. I'm going to jump over to 1 John 1, 9. These are more of the ways of God. Now think about the ways of God. Love, without a shadow of a doubt. Think about, I'm sorry. Things happen way beyond you when you simply say, I'm sorry. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's pretty cool. Do you realize if you just confess, God will cleanse you of all unrighteousness? He'll give you a totally, completely brand new, unwritten on whiteboard that's squeaky clean every single time you confess your sins. He forgives you and cleanses you. Now, cross the page from chapter 1, verse 9, Chapter 2, verse 10 says, whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Well, so what? Is it talking about physically stumbling? It could mean that. But how many times do we stumble and fail to be who we'd like to be? We lose our temper with people. We get crossways with people. We stumble with our spouses. We stumble with our kids. We do things that were not as good as we wish we had done them. That's stumbling. When we love, it puts us in the light. When we get in the light, we don't stumble nearly as much. That is one of the ways of God. Just love. Chapter four, we find another way of God, still about love, chapter 4, verse 12. We talked about this last week. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides, lives, dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. Well, so what? What does it mean when his love is perfected in us? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, I hope you'll draw the fairly simple conclusions here. If you love, God's love is perfected in you. His perfected love casts out all fear. Fear is one of two primal emotions. Love is the other. Every good feeling is rooted in love. Every bad feeling is rooted in fear. So when his love is perfected in you because you've confessed, because you've loved, 
because you've done things God's way. His love is perfected, and that perfected love dematerializes all the negative feelings. It transmutes them, and you're set free. This is what happened to Dana when she was in that seminar, when she was with Dr. Lynn. She was trying to love him. She did the best she could. She kept saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It happened. She was cleansed of all those memories of her life and also her ancestors' life. She was cleansed of that. Perfect love came in and she was able to love Dr. Lynn. She was able to love the computer. She was able to love her husband, to love her son, and they changed. Because once God's love is perfected in you, then that love is in you. And when you love others, you're loving with God's perfected love. And God's perfected love will cause people not to stumble. It will cleanse them too. Because his love casts out fear. It takes away their bad feelings. People misbehave. This is really important. The reason people misbehave is they're trying to make themselves feel better. If they feel really, really good, they don't need to drink too much, to eat too much, to do too many drugs, to have affairs. They're fine. They don't need to do those things. It's their efforts when they mistreat you, when they lie, they cheat, they steal, they spread rumors about you. They're trying to make themselves feel a little bit better. It's a bad strategy, but that's what they're trying to do. And if you can help them, because they're in your world, feel better, their motivation to do wrong vanishes. It's transmuted into just enjoying the joy and the peace and the love that the gratitude that they were designed to live with all the time makes a huge, huge difference in your lives. When you go to the last passage of Scripture I want to look at today, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, Paul and Timothy were close, and Paul is mentoring him. Paul is discipling him. Paul is trying to teach him the ways of God, because Abraham and Moses and the Apostle Paul understood the ways of God. That's how they were able to change the world. That's how they were able to have become the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Huge. Abraham was the father of three major world religions. He was a world changer. Moses led the children of Israel out of 400 years of bondage and captivity and slavery, and they walked across the Red Sea. How did he do that? He knew the ways of God. So Paul is passing this on to Timothy. Here's some more of the ways of God. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. I like Ho'oponopono. It's real easy. It involves all of this, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So Jesus took 100% responsibility for this whole world. He left the riches of heaven. He became poor so that we could become rich. He saved us, and he wants us to be like him. He wants us to take 100% responsibility. He wants us to operate in the ways of God, which is love, which is repentance. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. God's way is forgiveness. He models it for us. 
and gratitude. Scripture is so clear. Give thanks in all things, with all things, for all things. So when we just sit by ourselves and we're thinking, I love you. So you can go through your whole day. And this is the average person is thinking 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. Most people have no clue what those thoughts were. That's a lot of thoughts. But what if you go through the day just thinking, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this traffic jam. Thank you that I'm sitting on Central Expressway. A mile from either exit, traffic is not moving in any of the lanes. And even the, 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 the emergency vehicles with sirens are stopped dead in their tracks. Thank you, God, because you might have just saved me for a life crippling accident down the road. Thank you, God. Maybe you're redirecting my life this way. Thank you, God. These kind of thoughts feel good. It's up to you to make yourself feel good. Think like God. Think about what he says, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. And the God of peace will be with you. I'll wrap it up with this. There was a man that Time Magazine declared to be one of the top 100 most influential people on the planet. His name was Wilfredo de Jesus. Looked like de Jesus. He's Latino. He became so affected because he stood in the gap. He went to Chicago as a pastor of a little church, maybe 100, 120 people when he went there. It was in the barrio. It was in a dangerous neighborhood. And he loved those people. And many of them were unlovable. He loved the homeless people. He loved the mentally challenged people. He loved the insane people on the street. He loved the addicts and the prostitutes and the alcoholics. He just loved people. And because he did so much for those people, he started a home, uh, got a ranch where they could get women out of prostitution and addiction get them cleaned up and sober and get them a job so they wouldn't have to be prostitutes anymore. He did things like this, and God blessed him. That church grew to have 17,000 people there every week. He kept it for about 20 years, and then the Assembly of God, it was an Assembly of God's church. He's the first Latino that they ever had on their executive board, and he became their treasurer. They trusted him with the money. And he's been with them since 2019. But he was willing to stand in the gap. He changed his world. He prayed for these people. He modeled for these people. He loved these people. And they changed. You have a powerful, powerful way of prayer and hope. Opono Pono. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. As simple as it is, when you clear and clean yourself from all the ancestral stuff, from all of this life, as you continue to clear that, it opens up room. It, God transmutates and gets rid of the memories and the data and the programs, and it leaves room for inspiration from God to come up. That's how people build big churches. That's how people do big things for God. They have inspiration from God. Inspiration may be as simple as you're standing at the Red Sea. You're either going to drown or the Egyptian army is going to get you, and God inspires Moses and said, stretch out your staff. <laughs> Waters part. That's inspiration. It may be a word. It may be simple. But inspiration from God is what we're looking for. That's when the miracles start to happen. That's when life gets better. Thank you, my friends on Zoom, for staying with me, even when my earpiece and my microphone fell out. I hope to see you next week. We're going to meet two more weeks. I'm going to take two weeks off. Next week, we're going to be talking about 
please forgive me. The last week before I go on a sabbatical, we're going to be talking about thank you. I'll leave you with that, and I'll see you next week.